The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. Today, we want to continue our conversation with Ryan Sothan. He is the outreach coordinator with the Nebraska Attorney General's Office dealing with scams. We want to talk about some newer scams that are out there and make sure that you don't get caught. It's a great show. Don't miss it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Live and Learn. My name is Kim Hachia. Today, I'm talking with my friend Jim Hogue. We're going to be talking about having cardiac arrest and how you survive it, which Jim did. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Julie Masters. Less than 100 years ago, the devastation of the Holocaust combined with World War II was underway. As Holocaust survivors reach advanced age, finding ways to continue to share their stories becomes critical. Joining me today is Dr. Beth Dotan. She and her colleagues have been working on a project through UNL entitled Nebraska Stories of Humanity, Holocaust Survivors and World War II Veterans. She will share the results of this vitally important effort. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Barb Tyler, and today I'll be talking with Suzanne Hatfield, who is the coordinator of a program that assists homebound seniors and persons with disabilities. The program is NeighborLink. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live and Learn. I am your host, Jerry Renault. Today, we want to continue our conversation talking about scams. Um, you saw the first segment uh, in March, and if you didn't, we're going to give you a, uh, some idea of where you can find that show. But talking about scams, it's one of the things that is very prevalent in today's society. We want to make sure that you um, do all you can to not be scammed by somebody and to not lose your money and to help us out is going to be, uh, again, the friend of our show, Ryan Sothan is with us. He is uh, with the uh, Nebraska Attorney General's Office. He's the Outreach Coordinator. Ryan, thanks for coming back and, and giving us some more information today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay, so just in case somebody did not see the March show, uh, we, we spent most of the time talking about the most popular scams that are out there. Let's just very briefly um, go back and talk about uh, some of those or at least list those uh, for people who might not have seen the show. Certainly. The most popular scams are still imposter scams, the art of the storyteller uh, with the story too good to be true, too bad to be believed, and they fall along the lines of business imposter scams, government imposter scams, romance scams, family emergency scams, and tech support scams. Uh, they're a means to an end. The immediate end is a transfer of funds typically that day. The scammers want a one call close. But if they can't extract money from you in the course of that telephone call or that day, they're going to elicit enough personal information from you to steal from you tomorrow via identity theft. That's the second most frequently reported and occurring fraud across uh, uh, the viewership here. But we've also seen some additional scams come into the marketplace, scams that I hope we're able to talk about today. We have pet scams have risen into our uh, uh, top 10, as well as home improvement and repair scams uh, and moving scams, believe it or not. That sounds fairly uh, niche. It's actually a major concern. Yeah, let's talk about those because uh, a couple of those are, I mean, we're not, we're not talking somebody asking for $100 or $150. This is big money, and it's your belongings, and uh, it's, it's work on your house and, and all of those things. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's do talk about those. But let's talk about the first one, um, puppy scams. And it's not just about puppies, obviously. Uh, it could be horses. It could be any other kind of animals that are out there. But it is, again, playing on the emotions of people and sometimes the loneliness of people. Let's talk about, um, call it puppy scams. How does it work? Uh, what should people be looking for? And then we'll give them a list of things that, that they, we can show them that if this is happening, it's probably a scam. Okay, very good. Uh, pet scams, uh, it's really a variation on the romance scam. Some individuals may not want to uh, uh, enjoy a new interpersonal relationship, but they have love in their hearts and they can pour that love into a, a pet. Within the uh, uh, range of pets, puppy scams, or, or pardon me, uh, puppy requests are at an all-time high. Scammers recognizing the opportunity have moved into the marketplace uh, believe it or not, by recent counts, there are over 30,000 fraudulent pet 
scam websites wow. in America. So what I'd like to be able to share is how might you, the viewer, know exactly whether or not this is a scam website in a scam breeder. Great. First, the website itself may not have a physical address attached to it. Uh, perhaps not even a phone number. They might prefer to do all communication through email or through a chat client, which is an on-screen form of texting, or through outright texting itself. Uh, the website might have stock photos of puppies. And understand that these fo photos are uh, adorably cute photos where the uh, pet might be named, and then there'll be a brief description about their characteristics, even their personality. Mm. But one of the, there's two other signs that I think are, are, are dead giveaways. One is, is strange forms of payment. Many of these scam websites do not transact in cash or Visa MasterCard options. Instead, they f uh, prefer exotic forms of payment. Wire mm. transfers, for example. Uh, or what's known as a peer-to-peer -peer payment system, which is a form of online digital payment. It has popular names such as Venmo, Zelle, yeah. or Cash App. Uh, I would expect those names to be fairly new to our viewers. If someone is talking about payment only through those methods, watch out. That's a red flag. The other red flag, very significant, the offer too good to be true. Many times these pets are offered at below market prices. I'm gonna choose one breed, uh, Frenchies, the French Bulldog. Mm -hmm. Wildly popular at the moment, and a Frenchie is going to go in the range of $1,500 to $3,000 per pup. Uh, can be as high as $5,000, even more. But in the scam websites, they're typically offered in the oh, 750 to 850 range. That's an offer too good to be true. So know your breed, know what it should cost you, and watch out for a below market price. And the, one of the interesting things about this, because uh, one of the ones that I had is that the price is fantastic. And so you're getting a, a registered breed uh, for a lot less money than, than you would if you were going somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But they get you a second way because you pay them the money and then it's like, well, now we have all of these other fees that we have to include in that you had, that you, so you just keep paying. They're, uh, they've primed the pump and then they're going to keep at the pump because after they've secured your desire for the, uh, for the pet, they're going to come back with other add-on fees. And the add-on fees might be certain shots that the vet requires to be shipped a specialized temperature controlled crate that has a significant cost. Oh, you'd like someone to fly with the pet so that they don't go in the cargo hold, that they can go in the main cabin? There's an upcharge for that. And they will upcharge you to your breaking point, many times doubling the cost of that pet. So watch out for those upcharges. They're typically bogus. Wow, okay. How about um, the contractor scams? Uh, it's it seems like it came about again, maybe partially because of COVID as people were working from home and so they want to remodel their house and they end up hiring somebody and it just turns into a disaster. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about well, this there's one. been a confluence of factors, but uh, we've seen just a spike in demand for home repair and improvements in part, as you say, due to the sheltering inflation, you might as well as have your, your home the way that you want it. Then there's been inflationary pressures as the cost of goods and materials, wood, right. for example, is about four times higher than it, it's been right. uh, his, historically. And then there's a shortage of labor. So people are feeling a sense of urgency to immediately secure the first contractor that they can find. And what's happening is they're finding out that they're getting scammed. So how can you know that you're dealing with a legit contractor? First and foremost, and it's such a simple and easy thing to do, most authentic contractors register with the Nebraska Department of Labor. Right. You can access the Department of Labor yourself for free by phone and validate that your contractor is a registered contractor. Next, make sure, no matter what, that you have uh, at least three estimates and then of the estimate that you choose that that translates into a written contract. That written contract should be able to spell out for you uh, such, oh, performance and payment milestones so that you know exactly what you're getting, 
uh, and when. Okay. Uh, and those are amongst a, a handful of things that we've actually covered in a contractor checklist that we have posted to our website. Okay, and we're taking a look at it right now, I think. Very good. And you can also uh, have that sent out to you if you would like it by calling our office. But it is available for everyone to review, and I think every point that's covered there is uh, uh, valid. Right. And worthy and, of uh, note. I, I like uh, negotiating a reasonable down payment because uh, I'm guessing these folks will ask for lots of money and maybe even start the work and then be gone. You're exactly right. In fact, the most frequently reported uh, uh, home improvement scam is the 50% down payment where the work has begun and then the contractor never shows up again and so they've left you with uh, a mess and with a significant down payment. Uh, the other is where the work has started the quality is observably inferior. You can make note, you can ask for change orders, it never happens, and they walk from the job uh, with an inferior work product left behind. And probably never to be seen again and never probably from again. out of town. <laughs> exactly right. Oh my. Well, if you're, if you're, if you're thinking about doing this, we, we encourage you to, to get this checklist and um, make sure you follow it. And I think most legitimate contractors will appreciate that because they don't want all of these bogus people that are out there giving the industry a bad name. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Okay, let's talk about the moving scams because this is, seems like it's similar in, in some fashion. Um, that, but this is, this is big money, big business or big <laughs> outrageous business. It, it is outrageous. Can you imagine having all of your worldly possessions loaded on a truck and then that truck not able to be located or your uh, goods held for a ransom when you've already paid a handsome price for that move to begin with? So if, if you're considering, for example, downsizing or um, uh, moving possessions to a second home, maybe in Florida or the desert southwest, uh, or perhaps you're moving to a congregate living facility. Uh, you're going to have to engage the services of a moving company. Typically what these scammers do, and we do have a moving checklist as well that uh, uh, viewers can access and review, is that you're going to want to be very, very careful not to engage with a mover who gives you an estimate without an on-site inspection. You definitely want someone to come out and see what it is that they're moving and then give you an estimate that's either binding or non-binding very quickly. A binding estimate means that they will move you for the cost specified, period. A non-binding contract means that there's going to be a little bit of flex in that bid, but no more than 10% over what they bid, and that's a hard cap. So you want a written estimate submitted by someone who has been on site and walked through your home to estimate, have it be binding or non-binding, and then avoid any and all pressure to sign a contract that day and then several other red flags that we've covered on our checklist. Yeah, and I would guess you can check with the Better Business Bureau or somewhere to see if the legitimacy of the moving company? Uh, you certainly can because a number of complaints are submitted to the BBB. There's also, uh, through the Federal uh, Motor Carrier uh, Safety Association, a booklet, your, I'm going to mistitle it, but it's basically your rights and you are to be handed that by the moving company as a federal requirement so that you know exactly as a consumer what your rights are as a consumer for your protection when it comes to an interstate move. And we can get this checklist yes, you from, can. from your office, right? Yes, you can. Okay. Through Very our good. website or by calling us. Our website is protectthegoodlife.nebraska.gov and our telephone number is locally at 402-471-2682 or anywhere in the state, toll free, 1-800-727-6432. Wonderful. Now, just before we go, social media, as we all start doing more with social media, um, seems to be an issue. I had a friend the other day who did something as simple as take a survey that somebody had sent them and for doing the survey, they got a free gift. They had to pay for the shipping, gave the credit card number and could be a scam. I that, mean, that's knows? one of many, and the scam artists know, especially as uh, people within 
this segment are moving online, largely moving online to social media to stay in touch with family and grandchildren. But what you have just indicated, the take this survey, uh, that tends to be compelling for a lot of people. Sure. Be very, very careful. It's typically an entree to uh, a, another scam or it's giving up personal identifying information which will be used for identity theft. Do not submit or click on any embedded link that might come across in social media and only accept friend requests from people that you actually know in real life. Uh, many social media accounts are rife with uh, friend requests or likes, this, that, or the other. It is social. It's expanding your network of contacts and friends. But people that you don't know, you should be very, very uh, dubious about why they're asking to be your friend anyway, and I strongly recommend uh, avoiding that. Also, la last point, don't overshare on social media. For example, if you're going on vacation, don't tell people Right. When you're leaving, don't post pictures from vacation. While you're there? You're advertising <laughs> that your home is empty and unattended. Right, right, absolutely. And, and again, just everybody should have an advocate. It uh, doesn't matter who they are, but everybody should have an advocate, somebody that they can talk to about this or say, did I do something wrong? Do I need to correct this? Yes, we have a, a significant problem with under-reporting within the segment. Uh, and so what I encourage is that for your own benefit, find that confidant, the person that you know and trust, whether it be a family member, a friend, or a neighbor, and use them as a sounding board in terms of what's going on in your life. What was the offer that came across social media? How about this moving company that you have selected? What about this uh, purchase that I'm thinking of making online for a new pet and have them weigh in with their opinion given the facts that you'll share with them as to whether or not this might be a scam. Uh, many times a scam can be identified early and you can save yourself the, the trouble and so uh, have the confidence uh, to share. Ryan, thank you so much for coming by and uh, giving up your time for this. This is great information. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thanks to all of you. And again, if you happen to have missed uh, the show that ran in March, you can certainly find it um, on the Aging Partners website. And we'll uh, show you a little graphic here of how you can find that show. And again, thanks to all of you for tuning in. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. Stay safe, stay healthy, and remember, it's never too late to live and learn. I was doing some shopping and got a pop-up on my laptop. Computer had a virus. So I called the number on the page, and the guy on the phone wants to take control of my screen to sort it out. Then I remember a tip I got from the AARP Fraud Watch Network. Control my screen. This is a tech support scam. Thankfully, my order still went through. Recognize fraud sooner, so your money lives longer. The younger you are, the more you need AARP. Hi everybody, welcome to Live and Learn. My name's Kim Hachia. Once again, we'd like to thank our friends at LNKTV and Aging Partners for producing the show. You know, in January, a lot of us kind of watched in sort of morbid fascination as Damar Hamlin, who was a, is a player for the Buffalo Bills, had a cardiac arrest on the field. And the first responders, other trainers came out and uh, they saved his life. And that was kind of a triggering event for my, um, my guest today, whose name is Jim Hogue, because he had a very similar experience. Um, he was not a professional football player, but he was running at the time. So, and Jim's story is really phenomenal and has a lot of lessons for a lot of us. So Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Really glad you. you're here. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate um, you having me. Yeah. Um, just full disclosure, Jim and I um, are friends from sort of the running community, which is amazing. You look at us and say, they're runners, but Especially yes. Especially me. Yeah. Yes, we are. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, tell your story because it's really compelling. And um, just briefly, tell us what happened. And what sure. Happened. I was out running. I was training for the Good Life Havsy. I think it was the second or third one they were doing. And my friends and I are goofy, and we were just we were trying to run the route and just practice. So we had headed out for a long run on a Saturday morning, and we had split in a couple of different directions. I was running with my buddy Brian. And probably seven or eight miles in, I had a major cardiac event. I had uh, what's called ventricular fibrillation. My heart started beating so fast that it didn't know what to do, so it just stopped. And I told him everything I know about that day, I've kind of learned from third parties, mm -hmm. right? 
But I said, I don't feel good. I need to stop for a minute. So we kind of stopped and walked. And he, he turned around. He looked at me. And I was kind of on, you know, had my hands on my knees. And I was kind of bending over breathing, which isn't terribly unusual. Um, then he turned and looked at me again. I was just face down in someone's yard. So he had the presence of mind, thankfully, and he had a phone. He ran down the street to the nearest street sign to figure out where we were, called 911, and uh, got a hold of them. And they led him through CPR. He knew CPR. He, I mean, he had trained, but they kind of walked him through the whole thing by the phone. So he had his phone on and went back and gave me hand chest compressions and kept me going until LFR arrived. And they got to me within probably five or six minutes. And they shocked me with the, uh, their paddles in the fire truck before the ambulance got there. And one shock brought me into rhythm, but it, it you know, led to a long series of events. You know, I was in the mm -hmm. hospital for a week, um, ended up getting stents, whole nine yards. So, so that's kind of what happened. I know you say it took the fire department six minutes. I bet it was the longest six minutes of your friend's life. It probably was. <laughs> it, well, and you know, he'll tell the story too because when you call 911, you get you get the fire truck, you get the ambulance, you get the police. And I don't remember what the temperature was. You know, it was October, so it was probably pretty nice. But he eventually sat in the police car with the cop while they were tending to me. And the thing he would say is it took a long time. Because, you know, you see on TV, the ambulance comes, they get you in, they slam the, you know, they pat the back and the, they off, right? Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't like that. So for him, he said just, it just felt like we were sitting there and sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. Um, and I eventually got to know the people that were in the ambulance, and I kind of relayed that story, and they explained why that was. But, uh, yeah, he, it was a long time for him. Yeah, yeah, and so then um, w when you got, you don't, you don't really remember very much about this, do you? I don't do remember you? anything. Yeah. In fact, I don't remember, it's really strange, it was a Saturday morning, I don't remember the night before. Wow. And I don't really remember anything. I probably woke up on, my wife would tell you I woke up on Wednesday, I probably remember waking up Thursday mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the hospital with her holding my hand saying, you're in the hospital, you had a heart attack. And I remember that conversation happening one time. She would tell you it probably happened six or eight or ten times. Yeah, so I just kept, you know, in yeah. and out. So I, so I, I was in the hospital till the following Friday, and then just went home and, you know, kind of rehab from there. Yeah, T um, tell me a little bit about your rehab. Um, I did a few things. I went through cardiac rehab because of the stents. So, but that didn't start. It was probably 30 days, 25, 30 days before, you know, between that. So it was just a lot of rest initially. I also went and did occupational therapy kind of stuff at Madonna, where. Um, I just ran through a lot of exercises with them because they don't know how long I was without oxygen and how long my brain was off. Um, and it's kind of weird, so we did those tests, and I always joked with her. I'm, I, I deal with everything through humor, so it all, it's all kind of funny to me mm -hmm. when I tell the stories, and I don't mean for it to be flippant, but um, I asked her the first time, I said, how do we know? We never did a, we don't know what my baseline was before right. we started, so how do right. we know if I'm performing well on these tests or not? But they were very basic things. She had little flip charts that would show it's just stick drawings of like a ball or a wagon or steps, and she just had me name those kind of things. And I missed a lot of them early on, according to her. So I did, I was probably supposed to do 10 or 12 of those, and after about six of those, she said that was probably enough. Um, and then the cardiac rehab was probably, you know, th three times a week for probably six to eight weeks once I started that. And that was mostly just going in and, um, you know, they would check my vitals and keep me monitored the whole time. There was a lot of walking on treadmills. They, again, the first time they have you walk on a track and sort of get your baseline, then they sort of a little bit longer, a little bit faster, and just kind of gradually go. But it was probably a month in before they really wanted me to even go for a walk more than maybe a half mile or a mile. I, I was very antsy to get back out there. Right. That's because um, you have runner brain. I do have runner brain. In fact, the first thing I remember asking the doctor after when I met the cardiologist when I was awake is I said, well, I run again. <laughs> he just, he looked at me funny. He said, well, if you want to. Um, but that was kind of my, and I, I don't know why runners think that way, but I really, that was my first, my first thought, which is weird. Yeah. And you have since completed a Habsy? I did. So I, so my event was October 1st of 2016. So I was training for that Habsy. I did the Habsy in 2017. So that was my goal. So it took me 13 months to do that one. The weird thing was, that was not my, the, when we were training that day, that was not my first half. That would have been half number 10, I think, for me. So I had done this before. I had run 13 before. I had run 12. I had run 15. I think we had set out that day to do about 12. And uh, ironically, when I got home from the hospital, I looked at my Garmin and turned it back on, and it had stopped. And so I knew exactly where, you were. where I was mileage-wise and, you know, the heart rate <laughs> yeah. shot way up. So Yeah, and so now you have a pacemaker, correct? I have an ICD. Okay, so which explain is, uh, what that is and how those work. It's an implanted device. It's kind of right here in my chest. It's probably about the size of a silver dollar, maybe, 
a little thicker. Mm -hmm. um, mine has two leads. It goes into the upper and the lower chambers of the heart. And so at the low end, for me, it is a pacemaker. So if we took my resting rate right now, I'd be at 60 beats a minute because it keeps me at 60 all the time. Anything above 60 for me uh, is on my own. But then if theoretically, if my heartbeat would get around 180 beats a minute, it'll start to deliver treatment. If it were to get around 210 or 220, it would deliver a shock mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. to hopefully just spur me back into rhythm. So again, the kind of event that I had, um, this device should help in that kind of a case right. just to get it back into a normal rhythm and get you to where you could get right. seek medical attention. Well, I know um, you and I chatted about when DeMar Hamlin had his um, episode and people were like, oh my God, he's in ICU. Right. Oh my God, he's in a coma. Oh my God. And you're like, yeah, that's normal. Yeah, every that's event. That's what you do. Yeah. yeah. And it's hard, you know, if you've never been through that. Right. And I didn't watch it live, but I, I'm on Twitter a lot, so I probably was aware of it within minutes. So then I turned on, I was kind of watching the ESPN coverage, and I was panicking, but I thought, you know, he's in really good hands because there's an ambulance right there. Mm -hmm. And probably outside of being in a hospital, probably being on an NFL field is one of the safer places you can be because the teams have physicians, the stadiums have equipment, and there's an ambulance right there. Right. Um, so I didn't watch, you know, they, they didn't zoom in, so you couldn't see that it wasn't moving. But when they were talking about taking him off the field and those things, it did kind of shake me up. I, you know, my event was six and a half years ago. I really don't think about it on a day-to-day -day basis, but right. every once in a while something will kind of remind me. That was probably the biggest trigger I've had for a while. Well, I know when I saw it, I literally thought of you. <laughs> right. Like, oh God, I hope Jim isn't watching this because yeah. <laughs> this is creepy. <laughs> but then as the week went on, you know, the yeah. next day they'd be like, well, he's still in ICU or he's in a coma. And then people would go on Twitter and panic. I'm thinking that's very normal. Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking in my case, you know, they had taken me into the hospital on Saturday and put me into a coma intentionally. So they do the thing where they lower your body temp to, I don't know what they lower it down to. Um, it was all planned and I was on a ventilator and I had tubes in. Um, it's kind of funny. So again, everything I've learned about my event has been through other people. Mm -hmm. And I have chided my wife for a long time that she, nobody took a picture of me. I know it's kind of morbid sounding, but it would be interesting for me to see because all my friends that came and saw me, right. you know, saw me flat on a table and saw me on a ventilator and saw me hooked up to all this stuff. Right. I have no, I have to kind of make that image up in my head because I don't have any, yeah. Yeah. any frame of thought. But yeah, everything that he went through timing wise was almost identical to mine. Yeah. So well, you know, he woke up and now, now they're doing this, but he's still on the ventilator. I'm like, yeah, that seems about right. Well, you know, and his story like yours is, you know, testament to a couple things. You know, he was in excellent physical condition. He was, he was in the right place at the right time, mm -hmm. kind of as were you, even though you guys had no idea kind <laughs> of where you were. Right. And um, the, the right people were there. You know, your friend, you told me that you guys had joked about CPR <laughs> before you left, cause, and that's runner brain too. Yeah, that is runner brain. And again, I'm, I'm kind of a smart aleck. So when we were leaving that morning, I do remember the week before I'd, I'd had kind of a sinus infection and cold. So I had probably had some stuffiness and all that. We were joking before we left. And this again, people tell me. Because um, I said, oh, my arm's tingling. It's, it's fine, probably having a heart attack, no big deal. And he's standing next to me, he goes, oh, it's fine. I know CPR, no big deal. So we, you know, we just take off and do our thing. Yeah. And then a third runner that was with us that day, but went a different route, he came and saw me at home a couple weeks after, or a week after I got home, right? He was really mad at me. I'm like, what? <laughs> why are you mad? You know, what I, he goes, because you, you were joking that day. You were joking about having a heart attack. I'm like, well, you know. But I, I can't tell you, honestly, I, I just can't remember that morning to right. tell you if I really felt right. weird, if I was just having the usual kind of stuff. But yeah. again, I deal with it through humor. Yeah. So I go through, we take beginner's luck, that's where we know each other from, and I help Anne with that every summer. And um, she's kind enough to invite me to tell my story, because she usually has somebody from Pioneer Heart there to talk about the impact running is going to have on you physically. Even if you don't see massive weight loss or whatever, it's doing good for you inside. Mm -hmm. um, so they invite me up to tell my story, and uh, you know, it's just it's it's one of those things. It's not only physically good for you, but obviously you have a really close set of friends that um, that were there for you when when you know. Absolutely. It's also, I think, a great story for all of us that we all need to have at least some sort of rudimentary understanding of CPR. Absolutely. And you know that you can you can make a difference if you know how to do CPR and you're willing to do it. That's the other thing. And I think that that helps. And I, you know, I'm sure when you're thrust in that moment like Brian was, it probably doesn't come naturally. But as soon as they said something to him on the phone, it was very natural. And it was there, you know, there was no mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Right. It's simply just, it's, just it's the, the hands-on, on the chest, 
and they tell you now just kind of you do that pattern and you think of mm -hmm. the song staying alive Stay from the yeah, Bee Gees from the in your Bee Gees. head. And just kind of do that staying alive and keep yeah. that rhythm. Yeah. And if you keep that going, yeah. that may be enough to just you know massage that. And yeah. You don't have to press hard enough that right. you're going to break ribs. And I don't I don't think I had any broken ribs or anything. Well, I know you had the opportunity then to meet the firefighters. I did. Or met paramedics. What are, what? So it was really weird, you know, because a lot of my neighbors and friends knew the story. And I got a call. So my event was in October, and I got a call maybe in January, and a message from my neighbor. He said, hey, would you be interested in meeting the guy that saved your life? I <laughs> go, yeah, of course. So it was just a friend of his, and they were having dinner, and they pieced it together. You know, we helped this guy. And he's like, well, my neighbor had this happen, and they figured out it was the same guy. So um, firefighter, I was also named Brian, just like the guy that was running with me, just as a coincidence. I talked to him on the phone for the first time probably that January. And again, his part of the story is amazing and fills in a lot of the gaps. And, there, and I eventually met the rest of the crew and I eventually met the people from the, um, that were in the ambulance because the fire department gives awards every year and they give a Phoenix award to any crew that helps somebody basically save a life. Mm -hmm. And they invited me to that awards thing to hand those awards out in person to my, to my people. So all the people that were on the fire truck, the ambulance, I got to meet them and give them a hug. Really emotional type yeah. of thing. But when I first talked to him, he said, you know, they weren't supposed to be at the fire station that morning. They were supposed to be at Home Depot doing one of their events for kids where right. kids could see the fire truck and all that. And he, he always chooses his words very carefully. Um, I'm not sure if we had been at Home Depot, it would have worked out the way it did. You know, so it, it's, again, right place, right time. The yeah. fact that Brian was with me. If I was running alone, I don't know if this would have had a good ending. Uh, he had his phone with him. I never used to run with my phone. I always run with my phone now, just in case. Um, and he just had the presence of mind to just run to the nearest street sign, just see, okay, we're at this intersection. And, you know, flag down the LFR when they came. Yeah. And, and the guys on the fire truck, the, the, the other guy besides Brian, he was just a wizard with that AED. And that was his thing. Yeah. And he, he, you know, almost like if you would think about a military person taking care of their gun and always making sure it's in working condition and oiled and proper, that's how the other guy was with the AED. Yeah. So just, we got it out, one shot. And they knew, coming to me from dispatch, that they knew I was a runner and they knew I was in my 40s. And so they felt, I mean, he said they talked about it on the way there, we can, we can save this guy. Yeah. And they don't always know. So it's yeah. kind of weird. It's nice that I got to meet him, and it's good for them, I think, because they don't usually get to hear the outcomes. Right. They right. take him to the hospital and... Yep, and that's the end of it. And I'm thankful for him yeah. every day. Yeah. I love firefighters. I'm thankful for them, too. Yeah. You know, we're out of time. You and I could okay. talk about that. So we just, we just opened up a whole new thing about... AEDs and how important those things are, and maybe we'll have to talk about that another time. But thank you for telling your story. I appreciate it. Me. Appreciate it. Glad you're here. Me too. Can't wait to see you next summer at Beginner's Luck again. And I'll be there. Big shout out to them, and I uh, want to say to our viewers, it's never too late to live and learn about cardiac conditions and how to save a life. My kid has been asking for this hot new gaming thing, and I was like, okay, he had a birthday coming up anyway. So I finally find the video game online in stock. Thing is. It was from this shoddy website full of typos. That's when I remembered a tip I got from the AARP Fraud Watch Network. Bogus website? This is a shopping scam. That is matching t-shirts instead. Recognize fraud sooner. He loves his. So your money lives longer. The younger you are, the more you need AARP. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Masters and welcome to Live and Learn. A special thank you to the LNK TV production staff Dave Norris and Aging Partners, and to my fellow co-hosts for your support. I'd also like to thank you, say a thank you to the late Lita Paul Drake. You were missed. Those who survived the events of the Holocaust in World War II are quickly coming to the end of their lives. Sharing their stories becomes vital to ensure this history is maintained. Joining me today is Dr. Beth Dotan. Dr. Dotan is one of the principal investigators and project managers of the Nebraska Stories of Humanity, Holocaust Survivors, and World War II Veterans Network Portal and Educational Website. Welcome, Dr. Dotan. Thank you for having me. It's really an honor to be here, and I always appreciate our partnership. Thanks for inviting me. Likewise, it's a great pleasure. Do you mind if I call you Beth? Absolutely. All right, Beth, thank you so much. Beth, you have spent your life focused on educating the public about the Holocaust. First as the founding executive director of the Institute for Holocaust Education in Omaha, and then continuing your work in Israel. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about your background? 
Sure. Um, I am actually not from a family of Holocaust survivors. Um, my work in the Jewish community in Omaha and um, as uh, uh, my master's is in Jewish education, and I um, am particularly interested in the work of Holocaust memory. Mm -hmm. um, in Omaha, we, um, the work came to us. Uh, really, it was educators and others wanting to know about the Holocaust at a time when um, uh, television programs were, were starting to tell that story mm -hmm. and Holocaust survivors were speaking out really um, uh, more so than in past generations. After uh, we developed our center in Omaha, I moved on uh, for a little while to Israel mm -hmm. and worked at the Ghetto Fighters House Museum. Mm -hmm working as the international director um, to uh, help promote the work that was going on there in the Western Galilee. Beth, you've done such important work um, in ensuring that, that people's stories and the history continues. So now you've come back to Nebraska, and uh, could you tell us a little bit about the current project that you've been working on? Sure, I saw an opportunity to extend and increase my education. I really thought that understanding the pedagogy that goes behind Holocaust education uh, is paramount because things are changing so quickly in our world today. Um, and it's the end of this generation. Mm -hmm. So through my work at the Institute for Holocaust and Education in Omaha, I got to know all of the survivor families who were still in the community. And I realized that along with a doctorate in Holocaust memory and education, uh, and having that huge village of people, um, there was there was something to be done, and that I held these stories uh, that that were given to me, and I needed to share them. You've been entrusted with their stories. Could you tell us a little bit about the people who are featured on the website, and why did you select them out of so many people? Sure. So it was a very difficult task. Mm -hmm. um, when I started my work at UNL uh, in the College of Education, teacher learning and teacher education, um, I saw that there was an opportunity to merge digital humanities and education um, in order to tell these stories. So uh, we were accepted as, um, I was the first student project in the CDRH and uh, we saw the opportunity to start to build um, a portal that would tell the stories. I had to choose five stories out of the many individuals and we chose people who are, were um, who had lived across Nebraska. So we had B. Carp who was a child survivor from the camps in France, which is an unusual story. Uh, um, Clarence Williams, who was a World War II veteran and liberator of the Dachau camp. His collection of letters and photos were significant to be able to digitize. Um, uh, Maury Yudis was a Jewish uh, veteran and a Dachau, um, a Dachau liberator. Um, and uh, there were two others who we included. So one of them is from Gary, Nebraska, Irving Shapiro. Mm. And another was Hannah Rosenberg uh, Grodwell, who was here in Lincoln and came right before the war and her grandparents were sent to Treblinka. So we have sort of these different stories um, to give the initial components of, this, of the portal um, an understanding of, of the wide variety of individuals and where they came from. You know, you've taken people from all across Nebraska and given voice to their experience and the power of that voice. So in our gerontology classes, students read books by such authors as Elie Wiesel and Viktor Frankl to introduce them to the Holocaust. And as an educator, and someone who's just done a beautiful job in helping to um, advance the pedagogy behind Holocaust education. How do you think these books will help people to understand the Holocaust? Well, I think these are 
perfect examples of narrative memoir um, survivors who were willing to um, put their story, be vulnerable and put their story out there. Um, it took a long time before Wiesel's book was actually published uh, because the world wasn't ready for those stories yet. And today, with social media, with everything that's exposed everywhere, we need to continue to capture these stories. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that uh, these are classic authors who should be read over and over again. Um, when I came to speak for your class, I, I read v Wiesel's book again. It had been 10 years, and I saw new things. I saw, I understood new directions of how to understand that memory. Um, and so one of the goals that we have with Portal is to aggregate as much material as we can. So if we have a testimony from one of the individuals, they tell their story, we transcribe <laughs> those videos or testimonies so that all of their material is searchable. But in addition to that, we're including all kinds of um, disparate materials that are out there in the world and we're bringing them to one spot. So it will be beneficial to be able to read a book like uh, uh, Night but use comparisons and understand who are who are the people who lived among us in Nebraska um, that may have had similar experiences. You know, Beth, what you've been able to do is to take, and, and I can't think of any other word, but horrific, horrific, tragic event. And again, you've been able to give students, whether it's students at the university or in other um, areas, to give them a sense of these were really people. These were real people who had lived a life um, and just how important that story is. Mm -hmm. I think um, when we look at the history of the Holocaust, we're looking at this destruction of democracy and how people who lived in a free world, um, everything was dis dismissed in their lives. Um, and um, understanding the life from those who survived, mm -hmm. um, as well as the trauma of the events and the loss of their families. But then to tell the Nebraska story of understanding how they were resilient. So you very generously introduced me to such people as Dr. Lou Leviticus, who is an engineering professor at UNL, just a dear soul, and Cantor Leo Fetman, another dear soul. Both of them spoke of their experiences as survivors to Holocaust, um, in terms of survivors of the Holocaust, to students at UNO and UNL. How are you working to preserve their stories? Their uh, documentation and stories will be included in the portal. Lou okay. is in the next, um, in the next group, and um, he was a dear friend of yours, of mine, and so many people in the community, so I'm looking forward to uh, gathering up his materials and although he was a child of eight or nine years old I think that we'll be able to find um, again the disparate materials that can supplement his narrative. Thank you. Beth, you know, first of all congratulations on completing your PhD, your doctoral program through UNL and now that you've finished your your doctoral work how will you find ways to continue to educate others about the Holocaust and also those who served during World War II. My hope is that this portal provides many years of continued work and that we will utilize mm -hmm. that central place for the new LB888, um, the, the Holocaust mandate in, in the state. That's good to know. Um, as well as utilizing this site for research um, for higher education. Outstanding. Well, our viewers will be able to access and see the website, what to see the web address, as well as some other materials that we think will be of interest um, as part of this program. Beth, as we come to an end, and again, thank you for uh, taking the time to be here. A question for you, what gives you hope? And especially as it relates to your work. I think one of the things that gives me hope and that I learned in my um, 
non-traditional education <laughs> as an older individual going back to do my doctorate work is that um, there, this material keeps evolving and that the digital world provides an entirely new level of meaning making for these narratives of survivors and veterans of the Holocaust. Wonderful. Dr. Dotan, I'm just so grateful to you that you would take the time to be with us and to introduce our viewers to the work that you've done with the portal. And for our viewers, um, thank you so much for your time. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. So I'm playing with a dog and I get this robo call from the Social Security Administration saying my card had been suspended and I had to call them back immediately. And that's when I remembered a tip from the AARP Fraud Watch Network. Random robocall? <laughs> this is a social security scam. Recognize fraud sooner. Robots. So your money lives longer. The younger you are, the more you need AARP. Well, I'm delighted today to welcome Suzanne Hatfield, who is the coordinator of the local NeighborLink program. Suzanne, what is the NeighborLink program and what is its mission? Well, thank you so much, Barb, for having me. With NeighborLink being a newer program, we're really excited to get out in the community and let people know what we have to offer. Um, NeighborLink began um, during the pandemic, actually, from a mayor's initiative in the spring of 2020. It was designed to link up um, com uh, community volunteers with homebound, isolated seniors, those with disabilities, um, those who are in need of extra support. So our program has really provided the needed um, support to help people stay healthy, independent, and engaged. So before this program came about at the pandemic stage, did was there anything like this before? Not that I know of, okay. no. Um, and, and it's um, something that we're going to continue beyond good. the pandemic because we found there's a need. Good, good, good. So what do you, what are the services that you provide to these seniors and people with disabilities? Well, um, at the beginning, uh, it was really designed for volunteers to do practical things like picking up groceries, library books, um, prescriptions, things like that, provide some companionship through um, phone contact, just check-ins, things like that. Since then, I say it's taken on a life of its own. Um, people have built relationships over time, and so volunteers see a need and they want to take care of whatever that need might be for a person. Um, we've had people that have done all kinds of things, um, really like setting up new phones, ordering items online. I've had people help with adopting a cat, um, finding new housing options, uh, hearing aids, picking up mail, you name mm -hmm. it. Um, really participants will often reach out with a more direct need, like maybe I need my trash taken out to the curb once a week, something like that. And in the end, they find, wow, I have a lot of other needs and I've got somebody who will help me with that. Mm -hmm. um, I really think this program is about relationships. Very in the much end, so. it's people just getting to know their neighbors, really. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. So who provides these services? I know it's a volunteer basis, but is there a cost to the person that's receiving the services? There's no cost for the person receiving the services and no cost for the people who are providing the services. So we're staffed by volunteers and those volunteers um, do a background check, um, they fill out an application. Once that application is complete, we do a little talking about just their background, mm -hmm. um, their availability. We try to match people up based off of where they live, those kinds of things. So um, I think I was reading it when I was kind of researching the program that they don't go into the home. Are they permitted in the home with both? Uh, is there any, any problem like to go in and get the trash? Can they do that or stay for a cup of coffee? Is that off? It was, you know, designed with the pandemic in mind, so mm -hmm. we don't ask our volunteers to go into the home. Mm -hmm. um, people have been meeting in other places. Sometimes oh. it's the porch. Um, okay. Sometimes they go out now when it's okay to meet face-to-face -face and, mm -hmm. and do things beyond um, the home. Um, we do require our volunteers to be 19 years old. Um, that is something that I should mention. It does make a really great opportunity for students, though, college students we found, just because of the flexibility um, and the minimal time commitment. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also really enjoyed seeing those um, intergenerational relationships happen. So when they, when they do this service, there's no cost to either. So are they paid a reimbursement for mileage? Is that how it works? Or no, or it's, how do all they do the volunteer. it's okay. all volunteer. So they'll probably take them to the nearest grocery store, or go to the nearest grocery store where they want. Um, uh, 
as far as errands, again, I'm going to kind of go back to that. Do they ever take the person as errand, or is that a liability? Kind of we don't provide transportation. We don't ask yeah. people to provide transportation. So how does a person volunteer? If I wanted to go in, you said fill out an app. So is there a site that they go to, or they? You, do you have a physical office? We do have an office, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, mostly we mail our applications out. Um, a person can go on to the NeighborLink website. Um, and fill out an online application or print it out and send it in, mm -hmm. whatever works best for the person. Okay. So, and, and how do you recruit them? Do you go through colleges or on uh, 19, I mean, kind of past high school age, but uh, how, how do you recruit more volunteers? Well, we do some advertising. Um, we also go out uh, to some neighborhood events. We've reached out to neighborhood associations. Um, we have done um, events at UNL. We've visited with different colleges. Um, we've done neighborhood um, coffee clubs, things like that, just to go mm -hmm. out and prevent, present what we have to offer. Mm -hmm. So um, when a volunteer comes to the door, how does the person inside know that that person is a volunteer? Do they identify themselves or are they, I suppose after time, they, they would get to know that p particular volunteer, but how do they know? Do they wear a badge or they're a hat? Or? Well, before they meet, um, we talk with both parties and we let them know um, contact information, a little bit about who they are, their name, that mm -hmm. kind of a thing. And then from there, it's really up to them on who contacts who first. Uh, but usually by the time they're seeing each other face to face, they already know who that person is. So they have their phone numbers? So, yes. So, they so after the phone initial numbers. process, then they just do it on their own. Mm -hmm. Kind of that way. So, okay. So, so um, as, as we all know, there's people with difficulties, disabilities. So if someone is deaf or they speak another language or they can't get to the door, who, uh, are they especially versed in that or is that something they should know coming into it as far as uh, reaching out to a person that is deaf or have disabilities? Well, we do encourage bilingual volunteers. Um, we are always looking for people with diverse backgrounds. Um, at this stage, what we've had, um, we've had some family translators involved um, and we do have a number of people with visual um, issues that we have people come in and read mail um, and ads and things like that. Will they put the groceries away if they were asked We to? have people carry in groceries too. A lot mm -hmm. of times we have people who are on another level in a building, in a condo or an apartment, mm -hmm. and so um, there's that stair issue and mm -hmm. groceries are brought up. Mm -hmm. So if after all the screening is done and the volunteers are set, if they find out, you know, this is, I'm just not comfortable sometimes with this person or the fit isn't good or they, they're just not clicking, um, can the person switch to another volunteer? Now, they can, involved? they can. Um, I'm happy to say that rarely happens, good. but on occasion if it just doesn't seem like it's working, it really is not a problem to switch to somebody new. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just curious, what is the majority of your volunteers, can I ask, is there a certain retirement sort of more, or is there a certain age range that have you been noticing to do this? I think um, the majority of our people are often newly retired, people who are looking to um, just engage with their community mm -hmm. a bit with their extra time, um, but we do have a number of students and we have um, some stay-at-home parents, we just mm -hmm. have a real diverse group of volunteers as well as a diverse group of participants. So do you, do you find that you said they're in groups, so, so to say like Rotary come in mass or does Sertoma come in mass? Do you ever you see know, that? I have had a lot of Meals on Wheels volunteers. Um, they make great volunteers. I was going to say, so, um, kill, yeah. kill two birds with one stone yes, sort of yes. thing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, um, and then what is, the, since this program is fairly new, have you seen a longevity range for these volunteers? Do they stay a year? What, what's the we typical? have a number of people who've been there since the beginning, and so mm -hmm. we're just going to be approaching that three-year anniversary, and we have people who've been there since day one. Mm -hmm. And how many, would you guess, maybe you know exactly, how many people are you serving at this point in time in Lincoln? Um, and is it Lancaster County or is it just Lincoln? It's Lancaster County. Okay. Yeah. Um, we do have a few people in Hickman and Bennett, that area. Mm -hmm. um, I would say we're sitting at probably around 80 some people. Oh, that many? People. Yeah. That many, that's, so that's 80 volunteers then, or just do, um, do a volunteer? We do have volunteers volunteer? that take on more, okay, yeah. We have um, some people who have found that the person they're working with isn't needing as much from them, and so they've reached out and asked to add another person in. Um, we have a newsletter every month we put out where we feature some people, non-identifying information, just saying these people are looking for this, mm -hmm. and um, we've had other volunteers say, oh, I can take on that that person mm -hmm. as well. Would that newsletter go to the person 
in the home as well? Do they have? It's just for the volunteers, for volunteers. really. Um, it's been a challenge, you know, not being able to see each other and face to face during this time mm -hmm. where we needed a way to connect the volunteers a bit. Um, but we're getting to that point now where we're looking to doing more of a meet and greet mm -hmm. type of thing. Is there a website that people can search out uh, to find out more information? Or, and then what is your physical address? To give? I know you probably have limited hours, but is there a physical address they could drop by to talk oh, with sure. you more? Or Absolutely, a website? yes. Um, we are at 555 South 9th Street. Um, and we're there. Um, I'm generally there in the afternoons, but we have our person named Susan in the front office who is there from 8 to 4.30 that can answer any questions. And what's that has. phone number? So, um, that is 402-441-7575. And do you have a website that they can visit as well? Well, we have, um, it's be neighbor link or neighbor LNK at lincoln.ne.gov. Mm -hmm. That would be our email there um, where you could answer any questions. So is there anything else that I have kind of missed here that you'd like to really stress about the program? You know, I think you've covered it really well. <laughs> oh, good, um, good, good. But I just, yeah, it's really about relationships and getting to know your neighbors. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, I suppose, just like anything else, it's kind of word of mouth. And yes. as, it, as it gets going, some, some, maybe in an apartment building, oh, this person came and maybe they could help you. And same with like in a neighborhood association. Exactly, of mouth, exactly. Like that. And we found that with the volunteers too, that now people who have had a, a good experience are passing that on to their friends. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much for taking time to come in to visit today about this wonderful program. And thank you again for tuning in today. Remember, it's never too late to live and learn.